All right, so picture this. You're sitting at your desk after a long day at work, Master Duel booted up on your PC as you intend on schooling some nerds for gems. Because you're a good player, you win the coin flip and set up a very original end board that you swear no other deck has ever made before. You think to yourself as you pass turn, surely my opponent has no way of winning from here. Oh, but that's where you'd be wrong. Your opponent starts by activating a spell you've never heard of, summoning a monster you've never laid eyes on before. That monster summons six other gremlins that look like they came fresh out of a swap meet. Your heart rate picks up, sweat grazes your forehead, you begin panicking. Oh, uh, negate! I gotta negate! But your opponent keeps blasting. Your board gets tossed around like a Caesar salad as your opponent serves you up a full course meal. The room around you dissolves as you get transported to a higher plane of existence, fed cosmic knowledge beyond your puny comprehension. And then it just ends. The defeat screen pops up on your monitor and you're left in awe. I guarantee that at some point during your Yu-Gi-Oh career, you've been absolutely demolished by a deck out of left field. A deck you had no knowledge of prior to fighting it, but that is now etched into the deepest corners of your brain. Coming out of that experience, you're faced with two options. You can get frustrated, call the deck meta nuke trash, and filter it out the next time you host a dueling book or Edo Pro Lobby. Or you can be like me and become inspired. I can't tell you how many times I've been humbled by a random deck and end up buying it not too long afterwards without testing it ahead of time. Trust me, I ain't the picky type. I'll go barking up every wrong tree that I can find. But some of you might need a little coaxing to make these sort of decisions. You're smarter than me, better than me even, and need more evidence before chucking your life savings at a table 500 pile. And so that brings me to the focus of today's video. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game full of decks with varying playstyles, though some of them don't get as much recognition versus the next. Being a certified rogue rascal, I wanted to highlight some of my own pocket picks that stood out to me for their unique qualities, hopefully convincing you to give them a shot along the way. Essentially, I want to talk about the decks you really should be playing. Complete and utter bias, you all better be prepared. I'll start with Valence. Pendulums have always been a very weird mechanic by trade. I get that we've had our fair share of monsters capable of setting themselves to the spell and trap zones, some of them even pretend to be spells and traps when they're destroyed, but monsters that are legitimately spells on their own? What was Konami thinking? As if the whole concept of pendulums wasn't confusing enough on its own, the playstyle they facilitate tends to err on the side of degenerate. By setting up the right pendulum scales, you can summon as many monsters as you want with levels in between those scales numbers from your hand or extra deck. Notice how Soul Charge is on the ban list? Kind of strange, right? The pendulum mechanic as a result has historically been a medium to facilitate multi-negate end boards, oppressive turn locks, and hideous FTKs. With all of this said, you're probably thinking, okay, so why then would you want me to play Valence Tune? Does it not fall into those categories? Well, it sort of does, I won't lie to you. But first and foremost, I feel like everyone is obligated to try out a Pendulum deck at least once during their time as a duelist. The mechanic is so wacky and intricate versus anything else that we have in the game, and I feel like not giving it a chance is the equivalent of neglecting a key part of Yu-Gi-Oh's history. More importantly, however, the approach Valence takes towards assembling his boards is far from that of the average Pendulum deck. I swear, it's not like the other Pendulum decks, mom. It's not a face. Valence is based largely on tabletop war games. Things like Battletech, Star Wars Legions, Warhammer, and it really shows. The majority of the archetypes cards focus on moving zones. Each monster has an effect when it's special summoned, but also an effect when it shifts from one monster zone to another. Shudonome, for example, searches for a Valence spell when summoned, but a Valence monster if moved. Voltage Viscount, on the other hand, can place a Valence monster in the spell and trap zone if special summoned, or in a Pendulum scale if moved. And yes, those are two separate things in spite of the fact that Pendulum scale is technically a spell and trap zone. This dynamic creates some incredibly challenging gameplay as you try to piece together your entire board. You have to meticulously manage which zones you summon your cards to to make sure you have room to move them to adjacent ones. The fact that Valence is Pendulum based actually adds to this. The majority of Valence monsters have the Pendulum effect where they can summon themselves from a Pendulum scale to the zone in front of it. At the start of a game, you can do this, say, 2-3 to three times before needing to commit an extra deck summon to clear up space. So you have to manage which Valence monsters you summon first versus others. On top of that, should you opt into a Link monster, you have to be incredibly mindful of where your Link arrows are pointing. Recall that Pendulum monsters can only be summoned from the extra deck to these sorts of spots. Naturally, you want to maximize the amount of Link arrows you can Pendulum summon too. But let's say you summon beyond the Pendulum to the EMZ, its arrows point down left and right diagonally. These conflict with the aforementioned zones above the Pendulum scales. See how complex this deck can end up being? Sequencing your combos incorrectly can completely bar yourself from a chance at that marvelous YCS Plastic Cup prize. Admittedly, it's this same complexity that potentially makes a deck as frustrating as it can be fun. 
Yu-Gi-Oh! is already a behemoth of rules and mechanics. I completely get if you're not trying to play 4D chess in a game already pushing the boundaries of 3D. There are plenty of other pendulum decks that can accomplish exactly what Valence wants to do without requiring all the additional thinking. If we look at this more broadly, pendulums as a whole mechanic are also rather flawed. They can come off as a glass cannon given how hard it can be to get enough names in the extra deck and then scale to summon them thereafter. Nonetheless, the flavor that Valence oozes is a real selling point and a reason I think you should try it out if you're currently on the fence. Okay, so maybe pendulums aren't your thing, but you still sort of dig the whole idea of zone placement mattering. Well, in that case, let's talk about the second deck on my list, Weather Painters. Yu-Gi-Oh! is no stranger to control decks. We've had plenty of people type up lengthy reddit posts complaining about how Edlick should be wiped off the face of the earth or drooling over lovely labyrinth's big badonkadonks. Humana, 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 humana. Moving away from the more trap heavy strategies, Runic is an eyesore, Guy Striker's players are drawing 7 without your consent, and Trap Tricks players are on FBI monitors. FBI, open up! Weather painters stand out from the sponge. I'm not just saying this because of how beautiful these cards are, but let's be honest, that is part of it. Have you seen these works of art? If you've read the Weather Painter Spells and Traps, aka the canvases, carefully, you notice that the majority of them give your monsters, aka the painters, in their same columns or adjacent columns, special effects. These range from searching for more with the weather cards, to bouncing your opponent's spells and traps, to modulating the attack points of incoming attackers. The link monsters in the archetype operate similarly, with Rainbow giving cards of points to Judgment-esque effects while Moonbow turns them into copies of Dinomiscus. Now, this gimmick might sound somewhat roundabout at first. Why not just have set effects printed on the monsters themselves so you don't have to worry about playing this minigame? Flexibility, my dear Watson. Let's say you have the Weather Painter Snow on your board. Because of the archetype's gimmick, she can be a pseudo-emergency teleport when you need more bodies, a mini Trishula if you want to get rid of a card your opponent searches for, or a reactionary monster bounce in a pinch. She's not limited to one effect or the other as long as you set up your canvases correctly. On top of this, all the painters inadvertently banish themselves for a turn to activate most of the effects they gain. This effectively allows you to reposition them later on to change what they're doing. The act paints, all puns intended, this lovely imagery of controlling the very skies of the earth, molding them into what you wish to unleash on your unknowing opponent. Though not the selling point of Weather Painter, or maybe it is because this card is kind of broken, the Archetype's field spell, the Weather Forecast, actually lets you use your canvases as link material. This is paramount because prior to the card's release, I promise you that the Weather Painter links took decades to summon. The whole concept of banishing your painters is neat, but doing so obviously deprives you of the necessary bodies to access your extra deck at a given moment. More intriguingly though, other control decks might struggle to remove continuous spells and traps from their board to replenish their disruptions. It's not too common a problem, but I appreciate that Weather Painter can make use of its excess cards and mold them into something meaningful, aka turning that excess chunk into a powerful dommy mommy. What other decks can you say this about? The archetype does have its flaws. As hinted throughout my hype up of it, the deck can play a bit slow at times. If you're used to jam pack 20 minute turns where you're running a game of solitaire at the expense of your opponents, Weather Painters is far from that. The deck also isn't insanely consistent. I tried to sell you on the benefit of canvases conferring the painter separate effects, but if you don't open the right combination of any of these, you might be unable to get your engine going. Even so, to my knowledge, no other Yu-Gi-Oh archetype functions quite like Weather Painters. The deck promotes a strategy similar to Valence in positioning your cards right to gain the most out of them. Though, as opposed to being a combo deck and an icky pendulum deck at that, these pristine portraits grant you the opportunity to ride the wave out and participate in a more relaxed game state. They force you to be a bit more methodical in setting up your win cons as opposed to flipping up auto wins like certain adjacent offenders. Now, ahem, you know who else forces you to be a bit more methodical? Well actually yes, I do. It's my mo Magical Musketeers. If you watched my previous videos, you're probably rolling your eyes at this point, slumping into the depths of your worn out gamer chair. Oh my god, he's talking about this damn deck again? Well yeah, it's my channel, what are you gonna do, dislike the video? YouTube doesn't even let you see those anymore. Chokes aside though, hear me out. Obviously, one of Yu-Gi-Oh's core mechanics entails you setting spells and traps if you want to activate them during your opponent's turn. Cards like Forbidden Droplets, Solemn Strike, and Aruma Karma Cannon can become incredible disruptions to your opponent's place. The only problem with this is that your opponent has the opportunity to remove them before you get a chance to fire them. They might have top decked a Harpy's Feather Duster or Lightning Storm like they always do, though any average mystical space typhoon or wannabe copy of it gets the job done too. This is the trade-off that a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh's back row heavy stratagems are faced with. They have plenty of powerful cards that have a window to be added before reaching their full potential. So what if you could activate these things from hand instead? Enter Magical Musketeer. 
At first, they looked like tiny fiend monsters that your average show could beat over. Come on, 1600 attack points? Cherry Beans Man is packing more than that. But every musketeer monster has a special line of text that states, during other player's turn, you can activate magical musket spells and traps from your hand. This allows the archetype to subvert Yu-Gi-Oh's normal game design and is what makes it so iconic. That chalice you would need to set, Raigeki Break, or Solemn Judgment? Nah. The whole archetype is actually based off of a German opera called Der Freijutz. This work tells the tale of a marksman named Max Wink Wink, who makes a deal with the devil to acquire magical bullets capable of always hitting their target. He does this to win a shooting contest so he can impress a girl he's fallen in love with. Kinda cringe, but a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do I suppose. Minus the part about getting a girl, Musketeer's concept of activating spells and traps from your hand is an adequate representation of being a gunslinger. Your opponent tries to do something, you draw your weapon and shoot back to respond. We've got effect negation, attack boosting, solemn judgment, and MF triple DD crow? Magnemut's got nothing on that. Something I think we also take for granted while playing Yu-Gi-Oh! is the fact that, even though you don't know what your opponent has set, you can at least see their sets on the field. Musketeer throws this knowledge out of the window. Outside of those instances where you directly search a card with, say, Casper, your opponent can't count exactly how many Musketeer spells and traps you have in hand. They might be familiar with the cards available to the Musketeer archetype and can try and play around them to the best of their capabilities, but at the end of the day, you're the one with the finger on the trigger. You could only have blinks in your arsenal, but your opponent believes you've got a loaded barrel. As cool as I always try to sell it as, Magical Musketeer, as were the two other options I talked about already, isn't perfect. Yes, you get to surpass one of Yu-Gi-Oh's key mechanics and get to live out a fantasy of being a fearsome marksman, but all of that is tied to your Magical Musketeer monsters. Removing them turns you into a sitting duck. There are ways to avoid this for sure. I mentioned how one of the Musketeer cards is a Judgment, for example. That obviously dodges some removal. You could also potentially set up multiple monsters so that if one gets outed, you have the other ones to back you up. Yet, this isn't always going to be possible. Sometimes one infinite impermanence is all that stands between you and death. But I think the rewards weigh out the risk. This is the central theme of the video, but there aren't any Yu-Gi-Oh decks that play quite like Magical Musketeers do. Some get close, but these fiends truly engross you in their concept. And if you can afford these exorbitant prices Konami is pushing nowadays because, you know, who can't? I surely can. Fiendsmith Musketeer generally does wonders. Alright, we've talked about Valence, Weather Painter, and Magical Musketeer. There's one more archetype I want to talk in depth about, and if it isn't what you were hoping for, don't fret. We've got a blitz roundup for this to touch up upon some honorable mentions. Of course, don't be afraid to drop your own takes on this topic in the comments section below. Otherwise, allow me to highlight Infernity. If you're a Yu-Gi-Oh boomer, you're probably skeptical about this pick. You're traumatized by the deck summoning a million XYZ monsters atop a million Infernity barriers, duplicating Trishula like Agent Smith was with himself in the Matrix, being cheated by people falsely setting their monsters to their spell and trap zones. Even if you're not a Yu-Gi-Oh boomer, you might be vaguely familiar with the deck's notorious loops at the very least. So why do I bring Infernity up? Well, that's because of the concept of handless. When it comes to the modern Yu-Gi-Oh deck, hand advantage can be paramount in winning games. There's a reason why everyone hates this level 2 gremlin, drawing cards is broken. Those extra cards you have could mean the difference between extending through a hand trap and flailing at the scene, or between outing a nasty board and auto-conceding. Plenty of decks nowadays focus on minimizing the amount of cards they dedicate towards a combo while maximizing the return they get out of completing it. Infernity pushes all of that to the wayside. The archetype's entire gimmick is having nothing in hand in order to play. You end up finding yourself trying to dump everything you have as soon as possible to make your Archfiends, Necromancers, and Launcher live. This naturally changes how you approach deck building. Suddenly, hand traps can become a liability, stuck in your hand if you don't have enough discard outlets to remove the excess. Monster-based extenders can fall into this category too, especially if they don't line up with whatever combo you're dishing out. You end up focusing more on spells and traps to further your plays from Monster Reborn to World Legacy Succession to Void Imagination. Board breakers become your friend when interacting with your opponent from Forbidden Droplets to Triple Tactics Talent. I won't deny that Infernity is a combo deck by trait. We've had too many of those in the past couple of years from Tier Lament to Hack of Fibrax Piles to Ad Emancipator. But at least those decks had a hard once per turn clause. Courtesy of this archetype debuting in 2009, almost none of the Infernity cards have such a restriction. Disappointed that each Unchained main deck monster can only float the first time it's popped? Ashamed that each Ritual Beast name is too shy to be summoned multiple times during your combo? Don't worry, Archfiend has got your back. I've been playtesting this deck for only a month now and it feels like the deck doesn't have a ceiling. A basic boo and want to make App loose and Void Ogre? Sure, you can do that. Feeling daring and want to Griffinlock your opponent instead? Fancy and totally possible. 
want to relive the old days of extra linking kids on stream? Suspicious of you, but that's also on the table. Of course, you can always resort to hand loop builds and pray you don't accidentally snipe a cash theosis. Essentially, there's something so satisfying in playing a combo deck from the older days. I understand things like snake eyes are crazy in of themselves, but you haven't played a real combo deck until you've foregone the legendary hard ones per turn. You can probably discern the downside to Infernity, however. I've already mentioned it. As cool as it is to have no hand, doing so is a glaring problem at times. Even if your opponent's combo deck feels inferior to your own, you'll usually need a hand trap or two to prevent them from invalidating you. Nowadays, quite frankly, you might need even 4-5 to five just to stand a chance. But, as mentioned, hand traps can become a liability to Infernity's activation requirements, de-incentivizing your incorporation of them into your list. Board breakers sound like an easy replacement, but you can't always hold them in hand as any other deck would for the right moment to activate them. You're forced to set them at times, which opens up the possibility your opponent removes one of them or the other before it's live. Yet, the sheer uniqueness in how Infernity operates is why I'm still pushing it. That, and the fact I've been sort of a crash town enthusiast for the past month and can't get Callan Kessler's theme out of my head. Alright, it's time for Blitz Round, baby! Do note that any archetype included in this section isn't necessarily inferior to the ones I've already covered. I just can't talk about every deck in length, especially not those I don't have a ton of experience with. Regardless, let me start a timer and... Fight! Dynamorphia is a neat spin on traditional slum variants, opting to pay more life points than you would normally need to for skill drain to summon a dinosaur skill drain. It is also one of the few decks that has trap fusion summons, which is kind of neat. Mech Knight is another zone slash column based strategy like Valence and Weather Painters that is able to summon in big dudes when your opponent inevitably forgets to play around them. Their art is beautiful, their lore is tragic, and they make for some snappy OTKs. Vanquished Soul is a deck I have mad respect for, as I have a 100% loss race to it. You can lock your opponent down with fan favorites like TC Boo and Dimensional Shifter while living out the dream of being a fighting game expert with various tagouts. Plunder Patrol is a pick if you're feeling mischievous as the whole deck's gimmick revolves around abusing the attributes of monsters in your opponent's graveyard to summon from your extra deck. There's a 200% chance you and your opponent don't know what your cards accomplish, which is fitting for the unexpected adventures of a pirate. Finally, the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG's newest exclusive archetype, Mimigul, is an adequate representation of what it's like to encounter Miyazaki's 50th Mimic chest in Dark Souls 3. You can't trust any set monster, especially the newest Mimigul flip monster which hand loops your opponent for two. Time. Look, I've spent this video piling on you all these random biased pocket picks of mine in the hopes I might pique your interest on one of them. Yet, I acknowledge you're not obligated to try any of them out. You might have that old reliable, one trick of a deck you always flock to and refuse to part ways with when a tournament comes around. That's perfectly fine. That's how I feel at times too. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a hobby for you to experience the way you want to, you shouldn't let me tell you how to enjoy the game. I do want to say though, that trying out a new deck, especially one with a design far from anything else we already have, can be an incredibly enlightening experience. You're prompted to approach Yu-Gi-Oh! from a completely different angle from what you might be used to, which, in turn, can improve upon your skills as a duelist. Valence and Weather Painter might key you in on the importance of card placement. Musketeers allow you to flip the core identity of spells and traps on its head. Infernity is a definition of a ball to the wall fun time. Decks in the Blitz round and even decks I didn't get to bring up also have their own gimmicks that teach you new lessons of their own. Best case, should you willingly partake in one of these options, you could accrue a novel partner to get in duels with. Worst case you know, you've at least explored what this gigantic game of Yu-Gi-Oh offers and might have even developed respect for how other players enjoy the medium. Regardless of whether or not this video convinced you to play something new, thank you so much for choosing to watch it. I won't lie to you, sometimes I'm uncertain about how well some topics will perform. I'm afraid to release new video ideas in case they completely flop. But all of your continual enthusiasm in my comment section constantly drives me to try out new things and to continue pushing myself as a content creator. That's why I invite you all, if you agree with my picks or have your own picks you'd like to shine the spotlight on, to leave a comment down below. Remember to like the video and subscribe, possibly, you know, join my Discord too, as numbers always help. And, though completely optional, if you're feeling generous, I have a Patreon linked in the description. Otherwise, this was Toon World, talking about decks you really should be playing, and I hope you have a good night.